In a previous module, we spent considerable time walking through the Trinitarian theology of Thomas Aquinas. Trinitarian theology, as we saw, structures Thomas' medieval Roman Catholic theology from its beginning to its end and decisively shapes every doctrinal locus that he treats. His Trinitarian theological system, remember, orbits around and expresses the organic link between the eternal processions of the Son and Spirit from the Father and the rational creature's participation in those processions through deifying grace conferred in Trinitarian missions. That grace elevates the temporal creature above his nature to share in the eternal being of God and in the divine processions of the Son and the Spirit. But we need to move on and recognize this. Trinitarian theology also structures Reformed theology from its beginning to end and decisively shapes every doctrinal locus that it touches. This Trinitarian system orbits around and explicates the organic connections between the Trinitarian processions and the covenantal missions of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, creating the invisible heavens as a temple dwelling and creating Adam in natural religious fellowship enfolded instantly into covenant, the covenant of works. After the fall, God brings the purpose of the covenant of works to its eschatological fruition through Jesus Christ's humiliation and exaltation and the church's union with Christ by the Spirit and through Spirit-gifted faith. Redemptive grace after the fall brings to consummation in union with Christ the covenantal communion bond between God and His people, realized in a heavenized temple dwelling in a new heavens and a new earth. All of this comes to fruition apart from grace that elevates the temporal creature above his created nature to share in the divine processions themselves. And so what do we see embryonically sketched in this opening observation? We see a fundamental contrast between traditional Roman Catholic Trinitarian theology and the way it shapes every doctrinal locus on the one side, and historic confessional reformed theology and is Trinitarian theology that shapes every doctrinal locus on the other side. There's a fundamental contrast between the two. This course will take the first steps toward developing a reformed Trinitarian federalism that stands over against the Roman Catholic Trinitarian sacerdotalism of Thomas Aquinas. By Trinitarian sacerdotalism, I mean that Thomas' system as a whole, his theology of divine and human processions in Exodus and in Reditus, carries within it a sacerdotal conception of religion, a sacerdotal conception of redemption applied. His doctrine of the invisible missions, remember, of the Son and Spirit, bring the graced participation of the divine processions to the creature so that the creature might be ontologically assimilated into those processions. Fundamental to Thomas' system is the communication of super-added grace designed to elevate the creature above his nature to participate in the nature of God. It's ontological assimilation through deifying grace. And all of Thomas's Trinitarian theology is devoted to that doctrinal conception. And therefore, every locus that flows from it, from creation to redemption to sacrament, and to eschatology serves that sacerdotal conception. We spent a lot of time developing that thesis in the previous module. 
Whether it's image of God, standing in need of ontologically reproportioning superadded grace, whether it's the incarnation, realizing that ontological reproportioning grace, or whether it's the Eucharist communicating that ontologically reproportioning grace in the deified humanity of Jesus, or whether it's that melting union of unmediated intellectual apprehension of the processions, Thomas's system is a Trinitarian sacerdotal system of theology. Now, Thomas has not been addressed programmatically in the way we're undertaking by a Reformed theologian in our time. In fact, I'm fairly confident to say that Thomas has not been addressed programmatically from Trinitarian processions to creaturely beatitude by any theologian in the Reformed tradition in the past 500 years. So in this module, I want to begin to take steps, programmatic and foundational steps, in that direction. So what do we need to do? We need to replace Thomas's Trinitarian sacerdotalism with Trinitarian federalism. And so a fundamental distinction between the Trinitarian sacerdotalism of Thomas and Rome needs to be set comprehensively over against the Trinitarian federalism of Voss, Reformed Covenant Theology. And what that Reformed Trinitarian federalism looks like is this. It's an integration of Reformed Trinitarian theology joined to Reformed federal theology that is self-consciously concerned to maintain and advance Reformed theology over against the Roman Catholic alternative. And so the integration of Reformed Trinitarianism and Reformed Federalism is a constructive move. Its application to Roman Catholic Trinitarian sacerdotalism is a polemical application. And this course is designed to do both concurrently, to advance Reformed Federalism on the one side, but to do it in sustained polemical engagement with the Trinitarian sacerdotalism of Thomas and traditional Roman Catholic theology. Now, of course, this is only the beginning of this necessary task of ongoing reformation. So I cannot say close to everything that needs to be said, but I can offer a series of sustained theological reflections that range the entire spectrum of our system of Reformed federal theology. And these reflections will map out an integrated theology of divine processions and missions that have a distinctive theological character and advance a self-consciously reformed system of doctrine from Trinitarian processions to the beatitude of the creature at the end of this age. These observations will range from the irreducible triune essence of God and autothean personhood to bringing the creature in union with Christ to the consummation of the covenantal communion bond. From divine intra-Trinitarian procession to the beatitude of the creature united to Christ, Christ and his church in glory. Now, I view this as the beginning of a larger product that I, and I believe others, will undertake as we seek to awaken from a Reformed dogmatic slumber. The church at this point in her history, particularly in her Reformed confessional expression, has been slumbering as Roman Catholic theology rises in our midst without a comprehensive voice of critique being expressed from within that confessional reform tradition. Now, I've already taken some of the fundamental steps in this direction in a book I wrote recently entitled The Trinitarian Theology of Cornelius Van Til. 
This module is not a restatement of that book, but an advancing and refining of that in the light of Calvin's theology, the extension of that theology in the Protestant scholastics, the refining and enrichment of that theology in Old Princeton, Voss, and Warfield. And I will make a reference or two to its expression in Old Westminster, particularly in the work of Van Til and Meredith Klein. But let me give you a thesis that will guide these lectures, and then I will provide an amplification, six-point amplification of this thesis. Here is the thesis. The classical Reformed doctrine of the creator-creature relation, understood within a system of covenant theology, avoids the problems in Thomas's Trinitarian sacerdotalism and provides the path for the ongoing reformation of our doctrine, both in its constructive presentation and in its polemical engagement. So let me offer a roadmap of what will come in the lectures that follow that will give you an idea of what we're going to say from procession to beatitude in response to Thomas's Trinitarian sacerdotalism. First, Calvin's Trinitarian theology of autotheos and his doctrine of the irreducibly tripersonal character of the essence will be an anchoring starting point for everything that we develop. So as we start to talk about a Trinitarian federalism, one of the points we'll have to bring into view is Calvin on irreducible triune essence and its companion autotheos. Calvin spoke of the Trinitarian processions occurring within the being of God. The Son is God of himself, if we think of his essence, yet he is Son from the Father, if we think of his person. The essence of God rather than being initially folded into the Father alone as the principle of unity within the Trinity, belongs equally and irreducibly to each Trinitarian person. That is fundamental. That is foundational to everything Calvinists hold dear in distinction to Thomists. Calvin's mature theology of the Trinity did not teach that the Father is the principle of unity for the essence of God. He did not teach that the Father is the principle of unity in the Godhead. He did not teach that the Father communicates the essence to the Son along with his generation, or that the Father and the Son together communicate the essence to the Spirit along with his spiration. The essence of God is not communicated from person to person, but is irreducibly triune. That's the conception. That is the deeper Protestant conception of the essence of God, irreducibly tripersonal. But Thomas, in contrast, spoke of the unity of the essence residing in the Father and then being communicated to the Son and to the Spirit in the divine processions. This, as I will develop soon, makes it impossible for Thomas to say that the essence of God is irreducibly triune. Why? Because the essence processes with the persons, according to Thomas. As persons process, the essence is communicated in those processional movements. 
Though it's not generated or spirated per se, it is nonetheless communicated. This leads Thomas toward abstracting the essence of the Son and Spirit from the Father as we envision the processional movements, the processional acts of generation and spiration. This leads Thomas toward a hierarchy in the Trinity insofar as the Father is the source of deity for the Son and for the Holy Spirit. This is a move Bonaventure made from the shared starting point with Thomas. So there's precedent in a contemporary of Thomas drawing the conclusion of hierarchy from Thomas' own model of Exodus and Reditus. But Calvin, affirming autotheos, and Calvin insisting that the essence is irredus irreducibly triune, as found throughout his work, that means there is no way to abstract the essence of God from the three persons or vice versa. There's no way to find a principle of hierarchy in a communicated essence because the persons are exhaustively correlative within the irreducible triune essence of God. Processions occur within the being of God. The being of God is irreducibly triune. There's no abstraction. There's no hierarchy. That's point one. Second, Voss, following Turretin and paving the way for Van Til, spoke of Trinitarian perichoresis. Trinitarian perichoresis among autothean persons. And Voss said this. He said, perichoresis is a movement within the being of God that consists in an internal circulation of mutual and reciprocal relations among persons in the Godhead. And that reality, that perichoretic reality, provides the archetype after which the image bearer is created. The eternal movement, internal circulation, and reciprocal personal relation among the Trinity is replicated in the creation of Adam as the image of God and in covenant with God. It's a fundamental insight. So, autotheos, then, not only teaches that Trinitarian persons are immutable, impassable, and simple, but autotheos, when joined to a proper doctrine of perichoresis, teaches that those immutable, impassable, and simple persons are in an eternal movement of internal circulation within the being of God. They are living as they are immutable. They are dynamic as they are impassable within the divine processions and in relations of mutual indwelling. So the Father filiates the Son in an eternal movement. The Father and Son spirate the Spirit in an eternal movement. Yet there is no change or composition in the essence of God or the Trinitarian persons who are that divine essence. This formulation excises at the root the problem of evangelical pantheism, evangelical mutualism. Any doctrine that says in order for God to become relatable, he has to take on new dynamic and mutable properties. No, there is an immutable, eternal, living dynamism in the Trinity. And God relates to creatures as such from his self-contained, living and immutable fullness. You see, it is this Trinitarian reality that supplies the exemplary cause or archetypal pattern for Adam's creation in the image of God and his being instantly enfolded into the covenant of works as the image of God. This is the substance of what Van Til called the representational principle. 
The representational principle, as I will argue, is really more basically, if I could put it in a more conceptually crisp way, a representation on the creaturely level of Trinitarian perichoresis. That's what image and covenant amount to. God in special creation, God in a special act of providence, relates to the creature in natural religious fellowship that can be advanced by covenantal obedience to beatitude, and that relation is an ectypal presentation of the internal, eternal movement within the Godhead set forth in perichoresis. And that formulation cuts off at the root not only evangelical pantheism, but Thomas's doctrine of the religious relation standing in need of super-added deifying grace. Adam needed a covenant, not ontological assimilation into the being of God to advance. Third, third point that we'll develop in the course of this. I'm just going to use a single term, but it's a bit more complex than this. I want to talk and apply Meredith Klein's theology, and I will offer some reformulations of his theology on this, of the indoxation of the Spirit and the corollary that I have tried to develop over the past few years, the incoronation of the Son in the heaven temple in the absolute beginning. The incoronation of the Son on the heavenly throne the indoxation of the Spirit in the heavenly temple. Remember, it's a royal dwelling place as the Son sits on the throne. It's a holy dwelling place as the Spirit fills heaven with the glory of the triune God, sanctifying it for worship in the absolute beginning. This provides us with a comprehensive alternative to the Trinitarian missions of God. In the Trinitarian missions, we have something Klein offers us that is distinctive. Rather than ontological assimilation into the divine processions through deifying grace, Klein insists that Adam is created in the image of the triune God and the end of his existence is fellowship with the incoronate Son, the indoxate Spirit, in heaven, a communion bond brought to its fullness in the glory of the heaven temple. And the end of covenant is personal fellowship with the persons of the Trinity, the coronating Father, the incarnate Son, the indoxate Spirit. Klein also says, and I'll bring this out, that we ought in this formulation never to, quote, blur the creator-creature distinction, end quote, and invoke a, quote, unquote, monistic blender in the relation between the creator and the creature. What Bobbitt called a melting union. So the incoronation and indoxation of the Son and Spirit in heaven provides the end of creaturely existence in fellowship with God as He is revealed in His triune glory in the heaven temple. And that boundary between the Creator and the creature in the heaven temple remains. It is not lost as it is in Thomas's view of ontological absorption into the processions themselves, of ontological assimilation into the processions themselves. That is a species of Dionysian mysticism, and our covenant theology, and particularly the coronating Father, incarnate Son, and indoxate Spirit in heaven, that provides the boundary between the Creator and the creature, and the arena for consummate fellowship that Thomas's theology of a melting union dissolves. Fourth, as we develop this, we're going to talk about the importance of 
covenant, covenant theology. The theology of Westminster Confession 7.1 expresses what Voss termed the deeper Protestant conception of the image of God and the covenant of works that stands over against the Roman Catholic doctrine of the natural image endowment requiring the donum superadditum, or requiring superadded original righteousness, superadded deifying grace. Thomas, you remember, affirmed that original righteousness is superadded and supernatural. But the Reformed tradition teaches that it was concreated and natural to Adam as the image of God. Bavink has a helpful summary on this that I think is worth quoting. Listen to this. It moves from Calvin to the Confession and all the way up to even Bavink and Voss. Listen to what he says. Calvin makes a distinction between the substance of the soul and its attributes, and with Augustine says, the natural attributes were corrupted in man by sin, but the supernatural ones were removed. He even calls the latter extraneous, not an intrinsic part of nature. And many Reformed theologians similarly drew a distinction between natural qualities and supernatural gifts. Many of them derived immortality from the grace of God and not from Adam's nature. Even the ancient distinction between image and likeness was taken over by many and also applied in that sense. But listen to this. It soon became clear, however, that even where Protestants retained the expression supernatural gifts, they meant something else by it. The idea among Roman Catholics is that one can very well conceive a human being without these supernatural gifts. Indeed, as a rational and moral being, man would also have some knowledge of God, the moral law, and righteousness. But according to Rome, there is an essential difference among knowledge, love, and righteousness in a natural sense and these qualities in a supernatural sense. Between the natural and the supernatural man, between a human being and a Christian, between the world and the church, between nature and grace. Grace is not merely restorative, but an elevation and completion of nature. It was this position that the Reformation opposed as a matter of fundamental principle. And so it had to come around, and in fact did come around to the doctrine that the image of God essentially belonged to man by nature and that without it, man could only exist in an impure nature as a sinner. See, even in the early development of the Reformed tradition, Calvin meant something different from Rome when it came to supernatural gifts. As Bavink notes, according to traditional Roman Catholic doctrine as found in Thomas, there's an essential difference among knowledge, love, and righteousness in a natural sense, and these qualities in a supernatural sense, between nature and grace. Grace is not merely restorative, but an elevation and completion of nature, and it was this position that the Reformed opposed as a matter of principle. That insight, right there from Bavink, is almost entirely lost in today's Reformed theological reflection. The Roman Catholics understand it. The Reformed are struggling to recover clarity on that particular point. Reformed theology, to put it in my language, opposed the natural, supernatural, or nature-grace theology of Rome as a matter of fundamental principle. And how did it do so? By saying, A, Original righteousness is natural and concreated to Adam. And what Adam needed to advance his estate was not super added, supernatural, deifying grace. He needed supernatural, positive, verbal revelation in the covenant. Ex pacto meritorious obedience to that covenant. And the second breath of the Spirit advancing him upon completion of his probationary task. It's a fundamental contrast between sacerdotalism on the one side and covenant theology 
on the other side. And so Bovink said it had to come around that the Reformed view would see original righteousness belonging to man by nature. Without it, he would be a sinner. And this developed organically into a theology of the covenant. As Voss, in his essay on the covenant in Reformed theology, makes so clear. A fifth point, as we move along here, fifth point. And this is going to be something I note here and don't develop as thoroughly in these lectures as I could, or maybe ideally should, but that can come another day, is the significance of the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper in our understanding. The confessionally reformed theology of the Eucharist vastly surpasses and fundamentally critiques Thomas's doctrine of transubstantiation. It points in the direction of a sacramental alternative to sacerdotalism. And I do wish I could devote more to this point, but remember for Thomas, in a capsule form, and you can reference the previous lecture, the deified flesh of Christ is substantially contained in the Eucharist and is the instrumental cause of the church's deification. It is the reproportioned return of the creature to God, first in Christ and then to those who receive his body substantially contained in the Eucharist. And remember, to make this point clear, Thomas's doctrine of transubstantiation is an organic entailment of his conception of grace embedded in the reditus of the creature to God. But for Calvin and the Reformed confessional tradition, Christ's person is present by the work of the Holy Spirit who raises up the church to covenantal communion with him in heavenly places. The incarnate son of Genesis 1.1 is the ascended son of Hebrews 8.1. And in the Lord's Supper, in the Eucharist, the church is raised by the power of the Spirit working through the gospel to communion with Jesus Christ, the perfecting of natural religious fellowship under covenant brought to its eschatological fullness in Christ and in his church. The contrast is quite sharp. It betrays a fundamental systematic difference between Thomas and Calvin, between traditional Roman Catholicism and confessional Reformed theology. Sixth, and I will spend some time on this, although I have written on it extensively elsewhere, I want to talk about a Reformed theology of beatitude. Bavink and Voss spoke of the nature and destiny of man in ways that bring out fundamental and sustained contrasts with traditional Thomistic Roman Catholic theology. Bavink observed that the traditional Roman Catholic view of beatitude represented by Thomas, involves a direct and unmediated intellective apprehension of the essence of God in the divine processions. And he said that conception is a melting union, quote-unquote, that rests on a Neoplatonic vision of God and a mystical fusion of the soul with God and entails the erasure of the boundary between the creator and the creature. Let me put it simply. Ontological assimilation into the processions, according to Bavink, is mysticism. It's a melting union. It's a mystical fusion that eviscerates the distinction of the creator and the creature for all practical purposes. Bavink explicitly rejected as Neoplatonic, the traditional Thomistic doctrine of beatitude. 
He understood the traditional Roman Catholic theology to be fundamentally in conflict with the Reformed doctrine of the same. Voss refers to these very portions of Bavinck's incisive critique of medieval scholastic Catholicism in his review of Bavinck's Reformed dogmatics. And listen to what Voss says. Quote, With the nature and destiny of man, the debate returns from these apologetic outposts to the heart of the Christian and Protestant position. The Romanist doctrine of the Dona Supernaturalia is shown to have two roots. Please hear this. One in the Neoplatonic idea of a mystical deification as the true destiny of man. The other in the Pelagian principle of the meritoriousness of good works. If man is to earn the state of glory which is supernatural, he can do so only by employment of a principle likewise intrinsically supernatural, the infused grace that comes in the donum superadit. Now what I want you to appreciate here is that there is no conceivable way Gerhardus Voss is a Pelagian. Because Gerhardus Voss is critiquing a strand of Pelagianism he sees inherent to traditional Roman Catholicism. Voss's staunch agreement with Bavinck regarding the Reformed rejection of the Neoplatonic and Pelagian dialectic embedded in the medieval scholastic Catholicism of Thomas helps us recognize a fundamental difference that runs across the system. Let me put it programmatically. Beginning with Calvin's advocacy of an irreducible triune essence, conceiving the divine processions within the being of God, and understanding the nature of Trinitarian persons to be autotheon, God of self, all the way to the consummation of a covenantal fellowship that does not involve a Neoplatonic ideal of mystical deification that does not involve a residual Pelagianism of the merit of the creature. There is a sustained, fundamental, systematic contrast between the Trinitarian sacerdotalism of Thomas Aquinas and the Trinitarian federalism that develops from Calvin to Burgess, to Turretin, to Bavinck, to Voss, to Van Til, and to Meredith Klein. This contrast has not been noted by any Reformed theologian in the past 500 years. It hasn't been noted by a Reformed theologian in our generation. And it is time for us to awaken from our dogmatic slumbers and rise up and give a distinctive Reformed witness to Reformed Trinitarianism as the constructive path forward that alone has the resources to engage comprehensively the rise of Thomistic Trinitarian sacerdotalism in our day.